Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. But this morning, we began a new series um, about fishtails, the title of fishtails. So the, the, the title this morning's message is Jeremiah, Please Sit Down. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's uh, um, the idea of follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So basically what's happening is we're taking a look at four stories in the life of Jesus that are connected to four commands that he gave to those who truly want to follow him. And those commands are very, very, they're, uh, man, they're specific, but they're enticing. They, they challenge you. And so we're going to be challenging you this month regarding this because we have something bigger in mind. Amen? And so I don't know about you, but how many guys like fishing? How many girls like fishing? Just curious. You only had like three or four. Wow, there's a bunch of you guys. Good, good, good. I love fishing, but very seldom I would often talk myself out of it before I started going to it. Let me explain why. When I was little, I used to love, we didn't have a whole bunch of money or stuff, but I used to love just going down to the river and stuff. And, but we didn't have rods and reels and all this fancy stuff that we have today. We just took out a cane or we took a stick out and found some wire, threw a hook in there, put some weenies on there or something. <laughs> And we would throw it out there and catch these. It was easy, right? Sometimes the stick would break. We'd get a bigger stick and what, what have you. And it was, that, was, that was when it was the fun days, right? And then all of a sudden, as you get older, you realize, like, oh, there's more to it than that. Now you've got to spend money to buy a license. You've got to get a certain amount of bait. You've got to find out what a, a bobber is and should I use it, should I not use it. All these other things that go along with that, you know, and I just, the, the tools and all that stuff. So I really just kind of shied away from fishing a whole lot, even though I do it. I take my grandson out here and then. But here, here's a cool thing about this whole fishing idea. When I did go, I would always learn some great lessons as I'm going out there, like patience. Right? For some of us, I've been fishing with some of you guys. You're like, second, second, five seconds, pull it back in, five seconds. Maybe there's a, there's a season for that, but I just, you know, it just didn't happen like that for me. I just got to sit there, dig a hole, put it in there, and just wait and read a book or something until I see that thing moving. There's other things you can think about. You can think about, you know, the, the certain bait that you use that, you know, call those fish out. They, they tempt the fish, and it's like, man, I got this stuff. And I'd be thinking about, man, some of the things that tempt me and how I need to be careful with those things. Or every now and then you'd throw your fishing rod and, you know, you'd get something stuck back here, hit a tree or something, and you got to untangle all that stuff. And I'd talk about, talk, think about all the untangling that's taking place in my life and some of the stuff that goes on. So there's a lot of lessons that can take place. Now, probably it, mostly it happens to preachers. I don't know if you guys think about those lessons because you're out there just going forward, drinking a beer or whatever and just having fun. And for whatever reason, I just have all these ideas that take place whenever I'm doing that. So this morning, what we're, we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to challenge you in some areas. And we're going to start right here in Matthew's Gospel, uh, the fourth chapter. If you don't have a, um, your, your app, you can look at that Connect deal. And they have a little UR, QR code that you can download the app. Your notes should be on that app. But let me set you up real quick, first of all. In old days, back in Jesus' days, there's, um, fishing back then was different than fishing today. I mean, they had like a 30-foot uh, boat, which is almost the, the size of this, of this stage here. And, and in that boat, you could, you know, you could use it with, uh, uh, roar, what do you call that, oars? And, and you could just, you know, hang out that way, like row, row, row your... Oh, man, you guys are awesome. Yeah. Or, or you could just throw the sail up and, you know, let the wind take you or what have you. What's well, a whole lot different? Like today, man, you've got all these cheating mechanisms. you got these depth finders, and this is where the school of fish are, and this is how deep it is, and just all this stuff that's really, really pretty cool digitally, you know, but it's still, I think that's cheating. So it's, it's different. It's a different day and a season that we're in. Now, here's the deal. The common denominator between those that used to fish in Jesus' time and those that are fishing today, the common denominator is this. They both exaggerate when they fish, <laughs> and they tell their stories, Right? I mean, it's like, man, I caught this one that was awesome or whatever it is. And I've, done, I've been there. I've listened to some of these. I've made some fishing stories up just on purpose just because it's like this time the, 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 the reel bent so far down. And it was like, man, it had to have been a big one. It just got, you know, it pulled it away or whatever. And it really was just stuck on a rock or something. I just kept pulling it. 
Anybody have those? Yeah. So <laughs> what we're going to look at, and speaking of exaggerating stories, it reminded me of a story of little Johnny. Little Johnny was fishing one day. He went fishing. And um, when he was fishing, he didn't catch anything. I mean, he tried all day, tried different spots, and he never caught anything. And so he went home, but before he got to the house, he stopped at a store, a little fishing store. And he asked the guy behind the counter, he says, hey, let me have three big trout. He goes, oh, okay. So he can start packing them up, packaging them, put them in the bag. And stuff. He goes, no, no. He goes, you don't, you don't need to package them like you used to. Just, just throw them to me. So little Johnny, why do you want me to throw them to you? He goes, so I can tell everyone that I caught three big trout. <laughs> Anyways. Matthew's gospel, we'll go right into it because I took too much time in the first service and I got to get right into this message. Verse 18, Matthew 4, 18. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter and Andrew, his brother, Simon and and Andrew, brothers, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And what happened? Immediately, again, they left their boat and their father and their father and followed him. Good stuff, isn't it? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. (laughs) Now, let me explain before I go further. First of all, let me see if I can wrap this, wrap, wrap your brain around this. So... As a young boy in the Jewish culture, they would train you and they would teach you and they would pour into you lessons about the Bible, lessons about Scripture, the Old Testament. It's kind of like Catholicism. Anybody ever go to catechism? Many of us did. How many of you guys learned nothing? <laughs> and so, but back then, man, they would teach them the history. They would teach them how God was passionate about the world how God delivered their children. They would teach, talk about the Passover. They would study real hard. By the time they were 13 years old, they were like little grown men. They were encouraged to marry before they were 20 years old. But at 13, they've got tons of scripture. They had memorized tons of scripture on the prophets and you know, just different things. And then uh, for some at that age, they would, go to another, they would go to a tradesman and they would develop a certain trade. And that's, you know, some tradesmen would bring them into their home, and that's how they would uh, get ready for their adulthood. Other ones, they were passionate about God a little bit more, so they would go and start studying even a little bit deeper in order to become, this is what it's called, to become a disciple. And so uh, rabbis would come in, they would teach them in the evening. Uh, some of them would work in the morning uh, or, in all, you know, all day long, and then in the evening they would go and start studying about uh, Scripture, start studying about history again, same of those things. And it was a little bit deeper, a little bit stronger. And there are individuals who actually rose up a little bit higher, and they were really good students. And those students would go and try to make a living and eventually become a rabbi or eventually become a teacher or an instructor. Now, if you were in that that place, it was a good thing. I mean, it was just a calling that God had upon your life. You know, they recognized some of those. You ever recognize something that people have inside? It's just a a calling that was taking place. So they studied a little bit further. And every now and then, a rabbi, as they're instructing, they're looking for disciples, they would go along and they would take certain disciples, they would call them out and ask them to go and travel with them for a month journey or a few weeks journey or whatever, and so that they could go and they would have to live with them, they would walk with them, they would talk with them, they would uh, hang out with them, they would eat with them, and he would uh, instruct them all along. And so, so it was an honor to be called out by a rabbi. It was an honor to do that. And immediately they would just leave everything and take off. So what you see here in this passage, I always wondered, I was like, man, how would these guys just get up and just go all of a sudden? Well, they had already probably heard. Like, it wasn't like Jesus was, a, was a, you know, a, a very well-known rabbi at that time. He would be one day. But he was instructing. They probably had already heard him in the synagogue. And here's a rabbi who's coming in, and he says, follow me. And I'll make you a fisherman. Well, it was an honor to be called, first of all. So they dropped everything, and they began to follow. So that was kind of the culture back then. And so here's two points that I want to make um, to talk about this morning that is basically the outline of this message. The first one is this. When, when Jesus called him out, just like when he calls you out, you've got to make a decision. That's right. Good. Yeah. I know that's basic, that's elementary, but 
you got to have a, you have a decision to make. That's right. And you've got to make a decision. You're either going to accept and and embrace and 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 you know move forward, or or you're going to deny that, or you're going to put it on hold because you got to think about it for a little bit. Well, they didn't have that option back then. When he called you, it was an honor, and if you really wanted to be a follower of God, that you would just go and leave the rest up to God in that situation. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they just said yes. They just said yes. And have you ever met someone uh, in, your, in your walk in life that looked a little bit different, that felt a little bit different? Like, I mean, there's something awesome about this guy. Yes. Have, you ever, have you ever talked to someone who's like, man, that, there's something special about him? Have you ever talked to Pastor Marcus and said, man, there's something special? <laughs> <laughs> like, when I leave that place, it's like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm so inspired to go to jail <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> Um, you know, looking back in your life, looking back in your life, if, if you listen carefully and if you think, I bet Jesus has went by you at some time or point in life and, and called you. Anybody remember? Where it's like, hey, I'm calling you to myself. And for some, it maybe scared you. For others, it's like, what is that? What's going on there? I remember we were down at the, you know, down at the dam, that circle thing. I forgot what you call that. The bowl. Oh, the bowl. Yeah, the damn bowl. And so, so we were down there. This is before Jesus, so we were partying and stuff like that. And uh, I was with some gangster-looking guys, and I, I never really, really hung around those kind of guys. But for whatever reason, that, that time I was with some pretty crazy hoodlums. And I just remember, because it's just so, I just so, it, it, it reminds me of this moment. Because in the middle of our shenanigans, this guy drives a, a bicycle. And he, he, he puts his bike right there in the middle of all of us guys. And I start backing up. Because I'm thinking, I said, man, this guy's going to get killed. Because you just don't do that to these guys over here. Then he begins to talk. He begins to preach about Jesus. He begins to share the gospel with these guys. And I'm listening at a distance, but man, there's just something different about this guy. I don't know who he is, but that's the first time I heard the gospel being shared. I went to Catholicism. I went to all that stuff, but I'd never heard it like he said it. But I never did anything in that moment anyways. But I remember that calling where he passed me by. And it's like, man, I wonder, I wonder what he's really talking about. And it intrigued me. Does that make sense? Yes. And I'm sure in your life, if you look back, there are several times probably that he was just putting his finger on your, on your shoulder, putting his finger on your, on your heart. He was calling you. And for some of us, you know, we denied it. And maybe for some of us, you regret that moment. Or for some of us, we yielded to that, and you began your journey with God. You began following him. And it was an awesome experience, and it's been great, but for whatever reason, you got distracted. You got hurt maybe in the church, or, or something happened. Your, your wife left you. Just life happened. And it took you to a, a different path, and now you find yourself fishing or hanging out at the Dead Sea. It's not taking you anywhere. But you remember that initial calling, but you question. It's like, man, is, should I? Was he, was he, he wasn't there then. Well, why would I do this now? And so for many of us, we, we've, got, we've, we've gotten off course. And the reason why you're here today, if that's you, is because God wants to redirect you back right. to himself. Amen. Why? Because he loves you. Yeah. He cares about you. Because that initial calling, it was holy, and it still is. Amen. But what happens in life, in our life, and I see this in, this, in, in our culture right now, is that we have it backwards. We, we, it's called inverted. We invert this calling. And rather than allowing um, us to follow after God, we're asking God to follow after us. Without pursuing the kingdom of God and his passions and his, and his wisdom and his, his, you know, his, his grace and anointing, we're asking him to put all that upon this dream that I have. Does that make sense? Let me illustrate it real quick just on stage. Danny, could you come up real quick? So, so I, I, I called you, Danny, come and follow me. I'm not Jesus, but come, come follow me, okay? Are you, do you agree with that? Yeah. Okay, let's go. I'm going to take you on different places. Just stay close, though, because... Some of the places you won't understand, but I promise you, you, I'll protect you. I'll watch over you. I have something bigger in your life. Amen. You have dreams. You have things in your heart 
Nothing wrong with those. Some of them I put, a lot of them I haven't. But I want you to just follow me because I want to take you to different places. Be careful, though. Don't step yet. There's a snake there. <laughs> Jeremiah's there. <laughs> Be careful with this guy. I know you're his bud, but man, I'm telling you, something's going to happen if you stay hooked up with him. So be careful with this guy, okay? Cut, your, cut it off. <laughs> and so he's following. We're asking him. He's following us in some places we have no idea. But he's warned, he knows exactly what he wants to do in our lives. He knows the, the outcome of our lives. Be careful. It's going to be dark. We're gonna, you're not going to be able to see anything, but be careful because there's stuff that you might just trip over. Just stay close, okay? Just be real close. I've got special things for you. You know, I was studying uh, the shepherds in Palestine years ago. And they say that whenever they would guide their sheep, they would take them through still waters. They would take them up hills and down hills or whatever. But along the way, the shepherd would carry this little pouch. And he would put berries in it. They would go through different fruit trees, and they'd get berries and different things. And they'd put snacks inside of the little uh, pouch that they had. And while he's doing that, it would sustain him as, and strengthen him as he's walking. But also, he would get some of those goodies, and he would just put it behind him. And only the sheep that were closest to him would benefit from that fruit. So I need you to stay close, okay? Now, I, I know that sometimes you don't understand, and we're cutting things off, but it's important for you to do that. And it seems like it might be boring, but that's all right. Just stay close to me, okay? Because I'm going to go up. This way. But I heard that there's some dreams and there's some things that you have in your heart as well, isn't it? Yes. I want you to follow me in this. Follow me in this promotion. Not yet, yet, yet though. Not but yet. I'm going this way. But, but I want you to follow me this way. I have a promotion that I, I, need, to, I need to concentrate on. Yeah, I, I told me you I would promise you I would promote you. But that's not promotion for me. But it's, it's right in front of me right now. They're, okay. they're, they're offering it to me. Okay, go ahead. I want you to follow me into this relationship. I'm fixing to go into, but I know it's not healthy, but it feels healthy right now. If you know it's not healthy, you need to come back over here then. But it feels good, though. It feels good, huh? I want you to follow me into this. I want you to follow me into this dream right now, this dream of uh, retiring when I'm 50. Mm. This dream you know, of... You have dreams, and sometimes you have dreams that you think they're for me. There's a difference between dreams. If you go a little bit deeper, there's desires. I put those desires in your heart. Amen. Some of those things are just surface. If you dig a little bit deeper, there's some things that I'm pulling you to be a part of and experience. But I have this dream right in front of me right now, and it's presenting itself. Okay. Go. I'm go in your blessings. I want you to, I'm, I'm dreaming for a godly wife, godly children, but I'm trying to do it my way. I, I, I see it now. I can do this now, now. Yeah. Go ahead. See you later. You're not going to follow me? No, you need to sit down. <laughs> We, we, we just make this up, okay? But a lot of times, what happens is what we call inverted Christianity. Just for whatever reason, sometimes I'm trying to ask, he's trying to ask us to go certain ways that are familiar, but we've been hurt the last time we followed him. So it's like, man, I'm staying away from that stuff. It's not that he's going to cause things to become a whole lot greater or you're never going to get hurt. You know, only the sick can get healed. Only the broken can get restored. That's right. He promises that he would do all these things for you, but he did not promise that you would not have pain. Amen. In this world, you will have. Not you might have, right? But he promises that his grace is sufficient for you so that in your weakness, he will be your strength. Amen. And a lot of times in those crossroads, we divert and we begin going our own way and we have success. And what happens is that we're asking now God to bless our plans and our ways and hang out with this situation and with these people because that's where the promotion is. And a lot of times it's deceptive. It's deception. And so I'm encouraging you to just, if that's you in, in here, he, he might be recalling you back to himself. And, and I guess what I hear a lot is, is the question that some people ask me. He goes, hey, how's it going for you? Is it really working out for you? Or, or is there something still missing? Because you can still have stuff, and you can still have all these things, but there's something empty still. There's something, something empty, and, and it's connected to that original calling that he has for your life that you diverted. Does that make sense? Have you ever, have you ever gone through that in your life before? 
<clears throat> just a thought. I wonder at that time when Jesus was calling Peter and, and John, I wonder if he called other disciples and they didn't follow him. They, they said, I'm not ready yet. I, I got to go bury my dad or, or whatever. I bet. Have, have you ever passed up a, a, um, a promotion that was probably good for you? And you passed it up because you were already content where you were at. You're already okay where you're at. And it wasn't worth the risk in your mind. And yes, it might have been a holy thing, but it, it wasn't worth the risk because you don't know what the outcome was going to be. But you were doing fine just the way you are. And rather than uh, taking a risk with the Son of God, you're playing it safe. And when you play it safe, your life eventually becomes boring. Eventually, there's no adventure in it. You might be content. You might be satisfied with the stuff. As a matter of fact, A.W. Towser, I think, wrote, wrote, has a quote that it says this when he said it in the knowledge of the holy. We're left with a God who can never surprise us, never overwhelm us, never astonish us, nor transcend us. You won't experience that on your own by yourself. But you will experience it. So the craziest adventure in life that I've experienced is when I'm following Jesus. And I don't know what the heck is next. For many of you, your angels are so bored. (laughs) They're still clean. They're all white. They got their halo. Man, my angels are all jacked up. (laughs) Their halos are all, you know, they look like horns probably. (laughs) broken wings, and they're probably playing relays. Hey, man, this guy woke up again. Here, take, take, take today. You take today. And not only me, but Natalie as well. It's like, oh, God, she's up again. <laughs> they're both up. Now they're going in the same direction. Jesus, Lord. But I love the life that we live. Listen, I'm not saying that it's, it's safe. <laughs> I'm not. I mean, we've had threats. We've had people come over to the house. We've had things happen to me. I've had guys pull knives out on me. I had guys tell me they're going to kill me in this church. All kind, of, but it's beautiful. It's a great adventure. It's fun. It's like what's going to happen today, right? I'm minding my own business, and you get things. And Kim, the other day, Kim brought this, uh, showed us a picture. What was that thing, Kim? It was, it was a skeleton. It was, you know, when you ever, it's a target. Those body targets. Target. It was target practice, and it had us on it. But it was skeletons, and it already had a hole in the, in the heart. He goes, uh, this is what you got this morning. It's like, here, it's on the front door. I'm like, oh, well, praise the Lord. He <laughs> says, what do you do, right? You're doing something right. <laughs> what do you do if you're, if you're bored and, 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 and things are, you know, safe? If you just keep fishing and fishing and fishing in the same pond or in the same area, and you're expecting something different. You know, I don't know about you. The last time we went to Mexico, the, the other few weeks, a few months ago, just not too long ago, this guy took us out, and I said, hey, we want to go fishing. So he took us, and he went right around where the water turns a different color. And he goes, this is where you fish. So, man, we're throwing stuff out there. He's throwing it, and I'm throwing it. I'm, trying, I'm just following him. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just following him. Every time he reeled it in, I'd reel mine in. I'd throw it out. I just I act like I know what, he's, what I'm doing, right, just by following him. And then, I don't know, 10 casts. He goes, no, no good. He'd take off and go to the next one. He knew that area. And a lot of times, it's not, it doesn't make sense to us or because we keep going back to the same place, but there's nothing changing or not catching anything. And sometimes it takes us to go back to the original calling and, and ask the Lord, Lord, what? okay, let me go back to the last time. What did you tell me the last time? If, you're, if, you, if, you, if you don't know, if, you're, if something's going on in your life and you don't know what's distracting it and what's kind of messed it up, I, we always say, go back to the last place that you know he told you to do and start there again. Here's another question. Here's another question. Why are you in Seguin, Texas? And then why do you want to get out so fast? Right? I mean, when he asked us to go back to Seguin, I'm like, I don't want to go back to Seguin. Because your, your word says that a prophet is not welcome back in his own home. I says, I didn't call you to be a prophet. I call you to be a pastor. <laughs> like, oh, okay. 
And so Christianity, my friends, listen, Christianity is not a democracy where you get to vote. Christianity has a kingdom in mind, and there's a king who speaks, and when the king speaks, you obey. Hallelujah. And if you don't obey, you're going to find yourself with inverted Christianity when you're asking him to follow you and bless your plans, your, wisdom, your, your direction, your home, your children, and it goes on and on and never stops because you're blinded to what's happening right there in the midst of you. I know that might be difficult, but listen, I'm telling you because I love you and because God loves you. Your safest place, the safest place you can be and your family can be is in the will of God. Amen. When you're sold, sold out to him. Now, I'm not talking about you're sold out and you're called to be in the ministry. If he calls you, fantastic. Follow me and I will make you. He wants to make you someone that he wants you to become. That's right. It's not about what you attain. It's who you become along the way. That's most important. There's things that he'll take you through and up and down that might hurt for a second, but man, the character and the wisdom that you're going to experience when you lean upon God during those moments, nobody, there's not enough money in the world that you can have to hold on to that kind of a truth. Does that make sense? Coach tells me a whole lot of stories about the calling of God upon his life. And man, here he is of 50 years old. I don't know how he cards, but Man, he's still passionate, man. He's still going forward with the gusto. I love Coach. He inspires me every time. It's like, man, I ain't through yet. If this brother ain't through, I ain't through yet. It inspires me. It inspires my faith to move forward. You know that you're only one decision away from a totally different life. You're one decision away from saying yes to the Father's will. And your whole life, your whole family's life, a whole generation can be impacted because of one decision when he says, hey, follow me. I will make you. You know you're only three, three seconds away. Uh, whenever a decision comes, you've got three seconds to make it or talk yourself out of it. Yeah. Three seconds. One, thousand, one, thousand, two. I, I don't think I'm going to do that. <laughs> In basketball, three seconds is a foul. The other opponent gets the ball. In discipleship, three seconds is a fear. Right. That if you don't lean into it, if you don't lean really into it, in that moment, you're going to talk yourself out of an experience or a whole internship with the Son of God. And you would never know, you would never know the beauty of the Lord if you were to say yes to the will of God in your life. And it's so crazy adventurous. I don't want you to miss out. The second thing in this uh, idea, this message, is one, you've got to make a choice Two, every decision that you make has a price. It's going to cost you something. Does that make sense? It's going to cost you something. The disciples, they had to set aside their plans. They had to set aside their fishing career. They had to set aside the girlfriend date that they had the next week. They had to set aside all those things just to say yes to the master. The calling is free, but it would demand everything for the rest of their life. It wasn't easy, obviously, as you read the Gospels, but man, I'm telling you what, those guys, when I'm reading it, they're mentors to me. They inspire me. People often think, hey, if I say yes, man, I'm going to miss out on something. No, you're not going to miss out on anything. You can never outgive God. You can, your, your sacrifices are nothing to that. If you don't hold out on God, God will not hold out on you. No one has ever sacrificed anything for God. You'll always get back more than what you've ever given up. There's a missionary that's by the name of A.W. Uh, Milne. They call him and they refer to them as um, a one-way missionary. He was sent to go into an area in the Pacific where they were, they were cannibals. There were, there were people that would just kill. Any missionary that ever went there, they all were martyred, all of them. Not one of them had ever survived. But he felt called to go to that place. And so they got a one-way ticket to that place that location, knowing that they would possibly never, ever come back. And they got all of their gatherings, they got all of their stuff, and they didn't put it in a suitcase, they put it in a coffin. Because again, he knew the price that was right there upon him. But guess what? He didn't fear for his life because he already died to himself. Hallelujah. When he died to yourself, nothing, you're not afraid of anything. Amen. Because he holds you in the palm of his hand. And even if you were to die early because you're following him, that death or that moment will inspire so many 
Because it's not, even if it's a fragment, it's going to inspire so many that they would come to know him. And so he goes to this place and he, got, he, he finds favor with these individuals. And for the next 35 years, he preaches the gospel in this village. And then he dies. And when he dies, the, the, the leaders of that village, they took his body and they went and they buried it right there in the middle of that village. And on his tombstone, this is what they wrote. They said, when he came, can you put that on there? When he came, there was no light. And when he left, there was no darkness. Isn't that powerful? Can you imagine if that was on your tomb? I would love for something like that. When Marcus came in Seguin, it was crazy. But when he left, it was a hospital for the hurting. Amen. I'm not saying, I don't want that on my tombstone. I'm just saying. That'd be so cool. I want it. I, I want Mark the first, another passage of the same passage in Mark the gospel, the first chapter. It's the same thing, but at the very end, he does something a little bit different. There's a little bit different that, that we need to read. It says that going a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, that were in the boat, mending the nets, and immediately he calls them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with hired servants, and they went and followed him. In other words, these guys right here, James and John, they were loaded, man. The odds were higher compared to Peter and Andrew. And they had a business, a shipping, a fishing business. They had hired servants. They had cash. Mom and, you know, mom and dad were there. And they left everything because they were willing to say yes. Just say yes, Lord. Follow me and I'll make you. And the one thing that I know for sure this week that I got in my spirit for somebody here this morning is this. Follow me and I will make you stop. Forget the occupation. Forget the occupation. He's not asking you to become, you know, go into fishing business. He's not asking you, but he's, he wants to make you someone. Amen. If you follow him, there's a lot of self-help help books and a lot of good things out there that's, that's beautiful and all that. But I'm telling you, when you submit to the lordship of Jesus and you follow him, yes. he knows exactly what you need. He knows what he, exactly what you need to be deposited in your spirit, in your soul, and what you need to, and how you need to train your children and how you need to pour into those kids. He knows exactly. Follow me. I will make you. Amen. Keep your occupation. But here's what you're going to find out. That in that occupation or whatever you're pursuing, you're going to become a light. You're going to become something that you never thought you would become because God's drawing you and he's placing his anointing and his grace upon you. It's such a beautiful, beautiful life. He'll make you who you need to become. Amen? Amen. So why am I saying all this? I want you to experience, man, what I had the opportunity to experience. All I wanted to do when I said yes to the Lord, there on Manor Apartments, over by 123, I just wanted to say, be a better husband. I just wanted to be a better husband to my wife because I was so messed up. I just wanted to be a better dad to my kids. That's all I cried out for. If you used to tell me you're going to pass your church, I'm like, forget this, I'm going this way. I just wanted to be a better man. And I yielded myself to him. Next thing I know is I'm becoming this better husband. I'm becoming this better father. He started putting desires in my heart. I want you to go share the love that I gave to you. I need you to share that to someone. I don't don't know know how to do that. So I decided one day, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to let fear come my way. So the first person I went to go lead to Christ, I went just across the street, across the highway, and I met this guy that was walking. He was a Satanist. I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> Got to lead his, this man to Christ. Went down to another area. I saw this other guy, and I connected with him. And I told him my name. He goes, man, I'm so-and-so. He goes, I'm an arsonist. I literally just burned up this whole apartment complex here. And said, I got to share the gospel with him. And he came to Christ. I don't know any, people have asked, what did you, how did you preach to a Satanist and an arson? How did you preach to, I don't know what I said. I don't remember what I said, 
but I remember their names. God put their names in my heart, and it's, they're, still, they're actually written in my Bible. The second one, I told him, I said, hey, listen, he goes, what do I do, man? I've done this. I feel so horrible about it, but I want to come to Jesus because I know I need to be clean. I said, like, here's what you need to do. One, repent. Ask God to forgive you. Two, go to that judge and tell him that you committed this crime and put your life in, in, in the judge's hands. And he did. And he got sent to prison just for a few months, came back, came to the home and said, man, thank you so much. I feel so free. I can tell you over and over again the rest of this week and the rest of this series about the crazy things that happened as I began to yield myself to God's spirit and how God would supernaturally just minister to folks. I wasn't looking for any of that at all, but that was the journey. I just wanted to be a better husband and a better dad. One day, I was at Xerxes on 46. And uh, it was an old plant there. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me. He goes, I need you to go share the gospel with your mom. Mom and dad raised me Catholic. Man, I love Jesus. But I didn't know him. But now I knew him. So after work at 11 o'clock at night, I go to mom's house. And I said, Mom, i got to share something with you. And I got to share Christ with her. And she didn't give her life to Christ or anything. So I thought I blew it. I was like, man, she's never, you know, she was bad. So I, I, I left feeling bad about it. Well, little did I know that two weeks later, mom would be sitting in an in a operating room because she had to have immediate um, uh, open heart surgery. I didn't know about it. I found out about it whenever she got out of it. But she tells me this story. She goes, Marcus, they came into the room and they said, Lady, are you ready to go? She goes, no, just leave me alone. Just leave me alone for a few minutes then I'll be ready. And in those few minutes when she was there by herself, all she could remember was the gospel that was shared with her son just a few days before. And she surrenders her heart to Christ. She gives her life to Christ. And immediately afterward, that's all she remembers that she just went out. She had a massive heart attack. And they had to go do emergency surgery and she's alive. She's got like 15 lives now. She's still alive right now. My dad's another story, same thing. Here's what I'm saying to you. I want you to experience that. I want you to experience, maybe not with mom or dad, but with people that don't know him, that you're the, you're, you're the gate. You're the, you're the one that God wants to use to totally change a whole family's life. Or maybe your own son or your daughter or your home. I don't know. So here's what I want to, here's the take home this morning. I want to do this thing called Operation Easter. I used to train uh, folks with Billy Graham's crusades. And one of the things that we came up with was something that's called Operation Andrew. And you would start just by listing four names, four names so that uh, you can begin praying for them. Well, I'm going to shake, shake this up a little bit. Here's what I'm asking you to do. It's Lent season. we got about 40-something days before Easter comes. We're creating just a real beautiful, simple gospel message experience here on that Easter Sunday. I want us to do something that's called Operation Easter. Think of one friend, someone that doesn't know the Lord. And it could be your enemy. It could be your wife. It could be your son. It could be somebody. I don't know who it is. But you'll know. The Spirit of God will show you exactly who that is and begin praying for them. Just begin, just write them down. Get in a circle and just begin to pray for them from now for the next 40 days. That's what we call it line, uh, hook, line, and sinker. Drop them a line. Call them. Try to connect with them from now until then. You'll know exactly the opportune time to invite them to that Easter experience. Then the rest of it, trust God. Let the weight of God's love and compassion and mercy fall upon them. You do your part, God will do his part. And together, man, we will celebrate that all of a sudden, my grandma came to Christ. My mom came to the Lord. Hey, every now and then, I, 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 I hear you guys. I'm like, Pastor. My husband's here. I'm like, oh, shoot. The weight comes on. My other husband's here, too. It's like, oh, Jesus. No, I'm just kidding. Are you with me? Follow him. He will make you who you need to become. Period. Let me pray with you. Father, we love you. You're so good to us. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your compassion. Thank you that the scriptures are so true. 
we just desire to follow after you wholeheartedly, Father God. And, and uh, the results are totally up to you. You get the glory. You get the honor. Every person in this room, Father God, for those who want to yield to that, Operation Easter, Lord God, put that person in their heart and begin to pray. May your hand rest upon them. May your hand fall upon them. May you create just divine appointments so that when that call is there or that um, question is there or that invite is there, man, your spirit will just draw them to yourself. So we just trust you. We commit all that to you. We declare your Lord over it in Jesus' name. And everyone that agreed with that said, Amen. Amen. If you are ever in the Seguin area, Come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.